I'm very pleased to speak to economists and, and finance uh, person this morning because usually, as this cartoon uh, illustrates, um, what climate scientists have uh, are telling is um, quite boring for the uh, audience. But today, we're going to talk about the economy, so everybody will be alive. And I will try to keep you awake. Starting with maybe a slightly um, surprising picture for this uh, morning, a picture of Saturn. Isn't it beautiful? It's a picture which cost a few billion dollars, of course. It served many other purposes. The, pur the mission served many other purposes. It's a satellite mission which started more than 40 years ago, funded by the US and the EU. And if I show you this, it's because the same satellite took this picture. And on this picture, where you also recognize the uh, Saturn rings, which are equally beautiful, I think, you also see that small blue dot in the corner there. And that's our planet. And I think it gives some sense of perspective of what we are talking about. Another picture that gives the same sense of perspective is this one. And you are welcome to take all the pictures you want, but all my slides will be available on my web page tomorrow, so that may be easier. This is a picture taken by the uh, International, International uh, Space Station uh, four years ago, and it shows the atmosphere. Uh, maybe it's possible to make the uh, light a little less intense in, in, on the screen. You'll see better the colors in, in my uh, picture. Is it possible to um, decrease, to dim the lights a little bit? Um, and you see how thin the atmosphere is. The Earth is the only planet in the solar system which is inhabitable. And the atmosphere is a few dozen kilometers thick. And this atmosphere is getting richer and richer every year with carbon dioxide, which, as we know now very well, is heating the climate and might make it very difficult to uh, be comfortable for many ecosystems and many people. So the IPCC, which was created 30 years ago almost, uh, and provides reports after reports, uh, has said the following things in the, uh, uh, its last report, and, and I'd like to illustrate uh, some of these uh, key messages as uh, elements of context for the discussions you'll have today. The first one is that human influence on the climate system is clear. It's clear, at least since the middle of the uh, 20th century. Of course, there are natural factors playing in the climate system, but human factors, in particular greenhouse gas emissions, have taken over uh, and are today more important than natural factors. Continued emissions of greenhouse gases will increase the likelihood of severe, pervasive, and in many cases, irreversible impacts for people and ecosystems. While climate change is a threat to sustainable development, there are many opportunities, and we have heard this morning already from Mr. Gerson the, uh, the word opportunities. There are many opportunities to integrate mitigation, reduction of emissions, adaptation to the part of climate change we cannot avoid anymore. In a nutshell, humanity has the means to limit climate change and build a more sustainable and resilient uh, future. The IPCC was created 30 years ago precisely uh, to, to provide policymakers and decision makers of all kinds with the best quality information about the different dimensions of climate change. Not only the uh, physical science aspect, but also the science of impacts, the science of adaptation, and the science of mitigation, science being in the broadest sense, including, of course, also economics. So it tries to answer uh, those three basic questions. What's happening in the climate system? What are the risks? What can be done? 
As an element of context, have a look at this temperature curve showing the speed at which the global average temperature is getting close to the two limits agreed in Paris, 1.5 above pre-industrial and 2 degree C above pre-industrial. And 1.5 is much better in terms of reduced impacts. And you see we're getting close very fast. The last three years have been the warmest uh, of the last 140 years, basically. 2017 will likely be as warm as 2014, approximately, so still among the three warmest. Now, global temperature is something very abstract, but there are things that are becoming quite visible on the surface of the planet. Take a look at glaciers, for example. This is a glacier in Alaska, but you could go in Chamonix and see the same kind of things. Look where the ice is in, in 1961. Now, a picture taken a little more than 40 years later from the same vantage point, same camera lens, the same scientists. And you see the ice has melt, melted. And this is the behavior of most glaciers in the world. And of course, this contributes to increasing sea level. It's one of the factors, increasing sea level, uh, which has uh, increased by 20 centimeters already and is threatening many coastal regions. Why, all why is all this happening? Well, essentially, because the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere has increased by 40% above the pre-industrial value. You see here the last 10,000 years and the explosion over the last 200 years since the Industrial Revolution. Why is this happening? Well, simply because we are emitting, we have disturbed um, this natural cycle of CO2 shown here, I mean, two big loops, huge fluxes, billions of tons of carbon every year, sent by the oceans, but also absorbed by the oceans, sent by trees and soils, but also, also absorbed by trees and soils. Uh, fluxes which, before we disturbed them, them, were perfectly in balance. Now, since the Industrial Revolution, since we started to burn on a massive scale coal, oil and gas and deforest, we, are, we have uh, started to emit more than what natural systems can absorb, which means that what cannot be absorbed by natural system accumulates in the atmosphere and thickens uh, the um, layer of CO2 around uh, the planet and warms it. How do we know it's um, CO2 that's uh, warming uh, the climate? Of course, there are other greenhouse gases as well, but CO2 is uh, producing more than 80% of the uh, global effects. Because, I mean, one reason is that when you, climate scientists try to reproduce this observed temperature curve shown here for the last 100 years with climate models, uh, and when they compare uh, climate models um, forced only with natural factors, that's the blue curve, and climate models, or the results of climate models forced, and uh, the difference is larger with, with, with time, every vertical line is an IPCC report, uh, the red line is uh, co coming from climate simulations um, obtained with the same climate models forced with natural factors and greenhouse gases, you see that after 1950, it becomes increasingly difficult to reproduce the observed warming uh, without uh, the greenhouse gases. So the latest statement by IPCC is that it's extremely likely, a probability higher than 95%, that uh, human influence has been the dominant cause since the middle of the 20th century. Looking at the future, we of course have to look to work with scenarios. Uh, the, the top scenario is a business as usual scenario. The lowest scenario is a scenario with very intense mitigation, as I'll show later. When you, put, when you feed those scenarios for the uh, concentration of CO2 and other um, climate forcing factors to climate models for the next 100 years, this is what you get. Uh, for the lower scenario, an additional warming of approximately one degree C above present temperature. Uh, 
and for the uh, business as usual scenario, approximately four degrees above the present temperature, that means approximately five above pre-industrial temperature. You might think, this isn't much, five degrees, four or five degrees, why do we care? Is it really a problem? I mean, if we had today in Brussels four or five degrees more, nobody would uh, complain, right? But we're not talking about the temperature in Brussels on, on, uh, on uh, 6th of December. We're talking about the global average temperature, and that's quite different. But it's very hard to, to convey that message. So I will, I will try. I will try by showing you this picture, this reconstruction of how the planet looked 20,000 years ago. This is the peak of the last ice age, which of course, had nothing to do with human factors, the natural factors playing on much longer time scales explaining this. There were, there were high sheets two to three kilometers thick on North America and a large part of Europe. There was so much ice there that sea level globally was 120, I repeat, 120 meters lower than today. Why do I show you this? Because the difference in temperature between this planet and the planet we have today, if you remove the clouds, is only four or five degrees. And this transition took approximately 4,000 4, years, not a century. So getting possibly four or five degrees more by the end of this century is a, not only a huge change in the habitability of the planet, potentially, of course, different from this one, agreed. Uh, this is to illustrate the point, but also an extremely fast change. And we know how difficult it's to adapt when changes take place uh, uh, very rapidly. Of course, the average temperature is one thing, but locally, uh, there would be much larger values. For example, over continents, larger value in general than over the oceans because of the inertia of water. So this is for Europe in the business as usual scenario. In the worst case, by the end of the century, in the northern part of Europe, temperature reaching nine or 10 degrees above the present, which is a huge change. It's also changes in the hydrological cycle. For example, for the uh, business as usual scenario on the right here on this uh, diagram, is shown the increased, significant increase in the intensity of rain, intensity of precipitation in winter uh, by the end of the, uh, uh, of the uh, century compared to today. Why is that? Well, because in a warming climate, you have more uh, water vapor evaporated from the oceans, and so when the conditions are met uh, for uh, that water vapor to condense and become either rain or snow, the quantities are much higher uh, in a given time, with the consequences that we know, some of which are extremely heavy, uh, both in human terms and economic terms. Sea level uh, is due to increase in the future as well. Uh, this is for the two uh, extreme scenarios, the top one and the bottom one. Uh, you see that by the end of the century, uh, it's somewhere between 30 centimeters and one meter. And this was in the last IPCC report and probably the next will come with higher numbers. You might say, well, one meter, that's not much. Well, think twice. Look at the Nile Delta, for example. Now, the red zone here is just one meter above the level of the Mediterranean. And when this diagram was published by Time magazine 15, more than 15 years ago, it was 10 million people living there. It's probably more today. So they will have to move to find another place to live and cultivate. It's also another problem that's due to our human uh, CO2 emissions, and uh, it's not talked as much as uh, warming, it's as ocean acidification. The pH is the parameter that measures acidity, and the lower uh, it is, uh, the more acidic the ocean is. The acidity has increased slightly already, and is due to increase in the future, of course, much more in the business as usual scenario than in the other scenario. Uh, and this is, if you look at the past 25 million years, we have been able to reconstruct that acidity level. It's an extremely fast change. I mean, the acidity level has been quite stable for most of that very long period. 
But uh, if we stay, on, particularly if we stay on the business as usual scenario, uh, we would have an extremely fast change, uh, which would have extreme consequences for marine life. Coral reefs are already dying today. I mean, if you go uh, near the um, uh, Great Barrier Reef in um, Australia, for example, you can see that uh, every day. So impacts of climate change are already underway in the oceans, uh, on the continents, uh, in the tropics, and uh, around the poles as well, affecting rich and poor. But a common rule is that the poor are more vulnerable um, to uh, any uh, extreme events in particular. There are many, and this is a slide to look at uh, when you have my slides from the website, it's written too small here. There are many tipping points uh, in the uh, climate system, many thresholds uh, showing that when the temperature rises, uh, and this is summarized in this uh, IPCC diagram, when the temperature rises above the pre-industrial temperature, and this is the um, uh, the, uh, the right scale, here's the zero, here's the pre-industrial temperature used as a reference, uh, you see that the level of risk increases uh, for those five key reasons of concern that are illustrated here. And when you cross the threshold that is around 1.5 degrees, uh, you enter uh, the red zone at least for the first two uh, criteria. So, there are good reasons uh, to be on that lower scenario, actually, the blue scenario I showed earlier, shown again here. Uh, and we will see uh, what uh, it means to be on that scenario. You can guess it's a scenario with less uh, carbon emissions. Indeed, uh, when you take another diagram uh, from the IPCC, the last IPCC report, you see that there is an almost linear relationship shown here between the vertical axis, uh, which is the uh, global temperature increase above basically the pre-industrial time, and the horizontal axis, which is the accumulated emissions. So it's uh, the, the values on that axis, and the lower axis is graduated in billion tons of carbon. The top version is graduated in billion tons of CO2, a factor of four, basically you can see that what is shown is the cumulative total of the emissions. This graph is extremely important because it means that when you add any amount of CO2, you move to the right of the horizontal axis, and inevitably, sooner or later, you have a warming. So that's what's behind the need to go as quickly as we can not to minus 20 or minus 30 percent CO2 emissions, but to zero net emissions. Zero net emissions, which is a challenge that very few decision makers and policy makers have really grasped. We're not talking about decreasing emissions by 20 or 30 percent because we would improve the situation by 20 or 30 percent. The climate system doesn't work that way. If we add CO2, if we continue to add CO2, we move to the right here, and inevitably we will move, we will move, we will move up in terms of temperature. So it also means that, for example, if we want to stay below two degrees, of course there's a certain uncertainty agreed, and you can translate that into probability levels. But if you want to stay below two degree warming, there's an absolute maximum quantity of CO2 you can emit. If that probability level is 66%, actually a relatively low value, a probability of two changes out of three, who would cross a bridge which has been built with such a low probability as a safety margin? Nobody, probably. Still, this is the highest probability level you find in the uh, latest IPCC report, which I personally regret, but that's what we have. Um, which means that if it was a higher probability to stay below two degrees, the budget shown here would actually be lower. So what's behind this diagram, which you might have seen, without maybe the explanation that this is associated to a, a only a 66% probability of uh, being below two degrees, and it comes from here. I mean, if you, if you look... 
2,900 billion tons of CO2 is here, so it means that we are here somewhere, okay? Clearly, if the probability of staying below two degrees would be higher, the budget would be higher, it would be smaller uh, than this. Still, let's work on this basis, 2,900, but the problem is that we have emitted, or we had emitted in 2011, when the latest statistics for the last IPCC report were used, were available, uh, almost two-thirds of that amount. At that time, 1,000 billion tons was remaining, but we are emitting 40,000 every year, so you don't need, you don't need to, to have a Nobel uh, Prize in economics to know that uh, it's only uh, 2.5 decades before the budget is gone. Hopefully, there are other ways to uh, stay within that budget uh, than simply continuing to emit, which is what we are doing now, basically every year about the same quantity. It's even slightly rising again, unfortunately. Uh, there are scenarios in the literature, and also this comes from the IPCC report, showing that it's possible to be on a scenario like this one, the blue family here, uh, and stay below two degree warming but we have to accept and we have to realize that the zero line is here and that these scenarios reach zero globally well before the end of the century. And of course, if the uh, target was 1.5 degrees C, which is recognized by the Paris Agreement, it would still be sooner. So the challenge is really to go to zero net emissions as quickly as we can, and if we wait, uh, it will become increasingly difficult uh, to um, stay within the budget. Of course, we can continue to, to grow, but then we will have to reduce more later, and it will be even more difficult. Thankfully, the IPCC has a working group working on uh, mitigation and the um, possibilities to, to, to be on those uh, scenarios, and these are the uh, key sectors uh, they identified. Of course, we have 2,000 pages on this. This is just a helicopter view. But the key priority is a more efficient use of energy. The second one is greater use of low carbon and no carbon energy. The third one is improving carbon sinks. And the last one is lifestyle and behavioral changes through all the world, but particularly in developed countries. All sectors and regions have the potential to contribute particularly, as shown here, the building sectors where huge wastage of energy, we have heard something about that in, in uh, a few minutes ago, uh, because what is shown here is not the emissions by sector, but the potential to reduce emissions in a least cost approach as identified by the report of the IPCC in 2007, uh, but I, still, I think it's still relevant today. The last report, uh, said something about finance and about financial flows, which uh, might uh, have some interest for you. Uh, it um, reported uh, the um, changes in investment patterns from 2010 to 2029 at the world scale that would be compatible with a least cost approach to the two degree targets. And we're talking about, we're talking billion, in billion US dollars per year. And as you can see, the largest positive change is in energy efficiency. And the second priority is renewable. On the other hand, on the other side, uh, the bottom of the list, it also means decreasing investment in fossil fuel extraction and power plants without carbon capture and storage. There is much money available, including in Europe. I mean, just look at... This is approximate, probably there are better values today, but you, the EU spends every year f uh, 400, please correct me if I'm wrong, 400 billion euros every year to buy fossil fuels outside of Europe. So imagine uh, the amount of money we could uh, have to do other things uh, if we were able to uh, decarbonize the EU uh, economy. There would also be many co-benefits also discussed at length in the IPCC report. One of the most um, talked about is uh, an improvement in air quality. 
because if measures uh, to protect climate are taken in, in a clever way, it's possible to address the climate change issue and at the same time improve air quality. There are actually many other areas, as illustrated by this cartoon, that could be uh, improved uh, as well uh, by uh, going to a more sustainable, towards a, a more sustainable um, pathway. There are many opportunities uh, that um, are available uh, around uh, the fight uh, for climate change. Reduce pollution, health improvement, employment, gender equality, food security, redu reduce poverty, increased energy independence, opportunities to shift the tax burden away from labor and implement a sustainable development and the uh, 17 uh, sustainable development goals uh, adopted at the UN. Uh, two years ago. A few words on Paris, particularly today for this audience. It's often said that the uh, objective, the goal of the Paris Agreement is to keep the temperature below two degrees. Well, that's wrong in, in many ways. It's wrong because, first of all, it's not only two degrees, it's also um, con while uh, continuing the efforts, pursuing the effort to limit the temperature rise to 1.5, which is the uh, ideal goal to be pursued because the impacts would be much less severe at 1.5 above pre-industrial than two, and this will be highlighted again in the next special report that the IPCC will produce uh, in October next year. But it's also wrong because there are two other objectives in the Paris Agreement, in, the, in its Article 2, and they are equally important. The second bullet is increasing the ability to adapt and foster climate resilience and low greenhouse gas emissions development in a manner that does not threaten food production. And then the third bullet, probably somewhat interesting for you today, is making finance flows consistent with a pathway towards low greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient development, the two previous bullets, basically. What does it mean? It means, basically, even if it's not written very clearly, as you can see here by the third bullet, going to zero net emissions making sure that there is a balance between what we emit from the human side and what natural ecosystems and potentially artificial systems, but that don't exist uh, today at the appropriate scale, could absorb. So zero net emissions is uh, a goal uh, as well of the Paris Agreement. No, it needs to be... Um, uh, to be uh, implemented, because the, we have an agreement, but it's a framework, uh, and there's still much to do. As If you uh, compilate uh, the um, national plans um, under the Paris Agreement, uh, you are a little better in 2025 and in 2030 than on the business-as-usual scenario shown in orange. We are, you are here somewhere or there in 2030, it's a little better, but it's still far from the two degree least cost pathway or the 1.5 least cost pathway shown respectively in blue and green. Increasingly, uh, the uh, debate on climate change policies is taking place in the context of the uh, sustainable development goals I mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, reminds something The Economist, uh, who is not Greenpeace, said uh, a long time ago already, being dirty has lots of cost, being greener than the competition may have many advantages for far-sighted companies. I mean, we heard uh, Mr. Gerson mentioning that um, profit was sometimes a consideration. Uh, for far-sighted companies, the environment may turn out to be the biggest opportunity for enterprise and invention the industrial world has seen. My conclusions, the challenge is huge. Transforming the world in a few decades so that the whole world activities are decarbonized while poverty and hunger are eliminated in a few decades. Those are the objectives in parallel of the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, 
I'm convinced, and the IPCC is convinced, that it opens many economic opportunities and opportunities to address in a synergistic manner other societal goals, such as the 17 SDGs. Last but not least, addressing this challenge together will allow us to look at our children and grandchildren into their eyes when they will ask us how we contributed to avoiding the announced environmental collapse. And the finance world certainly has a key role to play in this. Thank you very much for your attention.